Boxing King Media in association with Box Road. Dominic Kingle, uh, a special interview today. I uh, wanted to talk about uh, your late father, the great Brendan Ingle. Uh, in a few days, it's going to be five years since he's passed. Um, does it... Does it still feel real? As, as it's as it's sunk in, because sometimes people say it takes a long time to get over somebody's death. Yeah, it's real. I mean, five years, half a decade. But the thing is, these days, because everything's so well documented, videos, quotes, social media, it's almost like it's still there. You know, the quotes keep coming up. Um, you know, and videos keep flashing up, and it's it's all there. The interviews are there. His his, his philosophies and stuff. So you know, it's, it's almost there in everybody's mind and heart still. So. You know, there's always something to look back over live, whereas, you know, years ago when people didn't have videos on the phones or you're just looking at photographs, aren't you? So it's, it's kind of really still there uh, in the hearts and minds of people. 100%. And uh, uh, one of the first things I wanted to ask you, because today we are just going to speak about your dad, is uh, every child, every son has like an early memory of the dad. What, what's the, you know, when I say to you, what's the first time you can remember maybe speaking to your dad or seeing your dad? Is there any particular day or time you remember? No, the, I mean, there's lots, of, there's lots of memories. All I remember, you know, from the early days is we were always active doing something. He always had us doing something like you know, uh, cleaning up or sweeping the streets or taking us for walks or always getting other kids in the community involved in stuff, playing football or taking them for walks or, you know, just generally making himself busy around the community and, and trying to educate the kids to, ki to keep really winker bank tidy and trouble free. That was the kind of his thing. So, you know, where, where the house is positioned in winker bank across from the gym. It was always, uh, you know, and there's a there's a passage through the churchyard to the other side of Winkerbank. You'd always get people cutting and through, and uh, you know, they'd be shouting to Brendan if he was in the garden. He'd always sat and talk to somebody. So it was, he was always talking to people. Everybody stopped to talk to Brendan when he was in the garden or walking past, and you know, they'd have a story too to tell. It was kind of like the centre point of the village at one point. It's interesting you say that because obviously I spent a couple of days with your uncle Tony, uh, one of three surviving siblings that your dad's got. I think you had 15 brothers and sisters all together. Uh, and one of the things I asked Tony was, where did Brendan get this mentality of, like you said, they're cleaning the roads, community, uh, bringing the community together? Uh, and he basically said, your granddad, Charles Ingle, and he was apparently exactly the same. Uh, any memories of your granddad and anything that you can remember your, uh, your dad, Brendan, telling you about his uh, dad? He was just a very stern, stern man in a way. He never kind of had much expression about him. He just kept a, a straight face. But, you know, it's no surprise because he got, like, 15 kids uh, to keep disciplined. So you've got to have some kind of system in place, uh, you know, to keep them all under control, otherwise they're being reckless. So, you know, I think that's where we all get it from. It's come down through the genes that you do your work, you do it properly, you do it precisely, and you get the results. And, uh, you know, that's kind of, you know, the Ingle way, and it's, it's run across all the family, all the, all the brothers were the same. They're all grafters, you know, they all did the work, they all boxed at some point at different levels. So, you know, it's just, it's, it must be an Ingle thing. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning that because a lot of people watching this probably will never know that your dad had, I think it was 10 brothers um, and then I think most of them were boxers, either professional dancers or professional, I don't know if you call them pigeon racers or what, but they all were in some sort of profession. Um, and also that's interesting is um, only two of them drank, so none of them drank, they never smoked. Um, and from what your granddad were telling me, uh, sorry, what Tony were telling me, uh, they were very selective about the diet as well. It was like a really simple, basic diet. Yeah, I mean, Ch uh, Charles and my granddad didn't drink or smoke, so he kind of set the example. Um, yeah, and he was an he was actually an English fella who, who, who was in Ireland. He was English. He was middle, Middlesex, wasn't it? Yeah, Middlesex. So he, he moved moved over there. So, uh, and they all kind of went that way. But th some of the older brothers did drink and uh, you know did, did gamble and smoke. But even my dad, you know, we, when we were kids, never drank, never seen him drinking, never went. He went to pubs. But he went to pubs to sing. So he'd he'd, uh, he'd work on building sites, and there's a pub over the bike there. And, uh, you know, they go down there on a Friday night and all the paddies, back in them days, there was a big uh, paddy community in Sheffield, a lot of groundworks teams, uh, labourers and stuff, and uh, they had an Irish centre. And they go to the pubs and they'd be up singing and stuff like that. So, yeah, he never drank, me dad. Uh, and that's just the thing what ran in the family. Like I say, I think only one or two of them did. 
Did you know much about your, you know, your uncle's uh, boxing history? You know, we was looking earlier, uh, Jimmy Ingle, who was one of them. I think he on box rec is showing as a, having 41 wins and 20 losses. And he actually fought Randolph Turpin um, in, his, uh, in the 50s. Uh, Randolph, who people may not know, uh, was the second man to beat Sugar Ray Robinson. Yeah, I mean, Jimmy was, uh, I think he, he boxed as a flyweight in his amateur career. He's only a small guy and based in, based in Luton for most of his life. And obviously, by the time he boxed the Turpin, Turpins, he was, uh, he was back end of his career. And I think he was amateur world champion. And I think the, the war coming along disrupted his, 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 disrupted his career. So, yeah, he, uh, he, strange enough, he, he had a gym in, in Luton when he died. He actually died in the ring taking somebody on the pads. Um, his, his, his grandson Sean Ingle is um, the chief sports writer for one of, I think it might be the Guardian for one of the big papers so you know they all turned the hand to something and they, they spread for and wide the Ingles they're all over the place but I think the basis of most of what they did the success and the discipline was all founded in boxing um, you know they were all taught to box and look after themselves and that's the thing they did in Ireland everybody learnt to fight and the other big thing, you know, what they were into is they, they actually call it pigeon fancying. So they were pigeon fanciers, so they got all these. I can remember going over and seeing the pigeons, and you know, they got coops of pigeons. And uh, they were looking after these pigeons, they used to race them, they used to breed them, uh, and they were always winning competitions. They were, they were worth a lot of money. So, which, you know, it's funny that because Mike Tyson was into pigeons and fighting and I don't know whether it's, it's a thing with boxers but you know all my uncles were into pigeons and, and fighting um, so yeah the, uh, they were very good at that um, they had a taxi firm in Ireland where they ran taxis obviously Tony's got a cobbler shop where my dad you know learnt to do it and you know from when I can remember just over the side across my dad's house there, there was a building site where they, they knocked a load of back to back houses down built old people's homes and flats I just remember my dad having a lot of cobbling tools in his shed, like uh, shoe horns and things for mending shoes. And I, I used to wonder why he got all these tools and stuff to, to cut holes in leather and, you know, stitch leather and all these kind of machines. And he used to actually cobble people's boots and the workers' boots on the side for a few quid. And he'd also learn to cut hair. So on a Friday night at the end of the week, everybody's queuing up for the barbers. He used to cut the hair on site. So he trimmed the hair up. He knew how to barber. So as, as, apart from getting paid for do, doing the graft on the building site, so at the end of the day he'd be mending the shoes and cutting the hair for make extra money. But like I say, he had to because he got five kids to look after. So he could kind of turn his hand to anything, Brendan. Um, you know, uh, and he was very good at that. I want to come back to that because it's interesting because I think when we did an interview a while ago, one of the things I said to you, it seems like your dad was ahead of time with regards to social media, he'd take out fighters in the 70s and make them do pad works in, in supermarkets and uh, shopping centres. Your, your granddad, Charles Ingle, um, from speaking with Tony, he was telling me about the training methods that he used to instil into all his sons, like warm-ups, warm-downs, uh, ice baths, which is bonkers. We're seeing all this sort of stuff now, strength and conditioning training, ice bats. But this was happening in, in, in the 1930s, 40s in, uh, in Dublin, over on, uh, I don't want to name the street, <laughs> but uh, over at your granddad's house. What is the street called? Um, I, I won't repeat it because he might end up having people... Because <laughs> I was a bit worried, I'm thinking, because Brendan's obviously got a loyal fan base, I don't want people rocking up at Tony's house and knocking on his door every two minutes. He, uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the thing with, with Charlie is that I even get back to my dad that, you know, my dad was dyslexic and he had, he, you know, I would, I would say in, in, in today's day and age, he had learning disabilities in the sense he couldn't read or write. But he came over here with orphan education and, and he learned to read and write and, and then he started reading books. Um, but when you can't, you're not, you're not formally educated properly, what you do is you find, you're not really constrained by normal ideas, so you have to find your own ways uh, and that's what Brendan did. He found ways. I mean, the, the training systems he created, he did it himself. Obviously, he, he was taught from his, his, his dad. And I think they had a friend of the family who was into training as well, who kind of coached them. And, you know, he kind of built his own system from there. And when I look how he trained people back in the day, you know, when I was a kid, he used to do, uh, you know, long jogs for fat burning. He used to do sprint work for, for fast burst. Um, you know, he used to do. He used to actually split the the training day down into four se into four four small sessions, and back then it made sense because, you know, people like Harold Graham they didn't work 
so to keep them active and keep the mind on it, he used to have four sessions. It'd be a, a five o'clock run, a five a.m. run. He'd have his breakfast, go back to bed. He'd come up and train in the gym about half past nine, do pad work. Then uh, in the afternoon, four o'clock, they do some sparring and then with some sprints on the end of it and then at night they do a steady jog again and this is the this is the times when you had to wane on the day of the fight so fighters were more you know you were more a true middleweight more a true light middleweight uh, back in those days because you weighed in at 12 o'clock on the day of the fight and you boxed at 10 o'clock at night so you had 10 hours to, to hydrate so you you could never get away with doing what fighters do these days dehydrating themselves down the night before uh, and then rehydrating up and coming in at a different weight class so in them days you had to you had to train different and i actually worked it out because i used to i used to do these runs, runs with harold graham at five o'clock in the morning and 9 30 at night five days a week and it was a six mile run and a four mile run that were 10 miles a day we used to run 50 miles a week and i was like 13 years old i think Harold was about 18 19 so that's what we had to do and it was no surprise when i was at school i won everything running you know long distance sprints everything never knew why because it's just something i did then I used to wonder why my dad used to make me send me out on the runs with him. Uh, and I think I might have told this story before. And I said, Dad, why, you know, why, why do you make me run with him at five o'clock in the morning? He goes, Dominic, he's scared of the dark. I went, what? He goes, yeah, he's scared of the dark. And at night times, so you got to run with him. I'm thinking that's a bit strange. I thought it was funny because he was like a man, 18, 19. So, you know, years later, in fact, it went years later, uh, maybe a year later, we, we stayed in the same room in Errol and uh, we're in bed. He went, turn the light off. I went, no, you turn it off. And I went, I'm not getting out of bed. It was winter, it was cold. We didn't have central eating. And I says, the reason you won't turn the light off because you're scared of the dog. And he just started laughing. He goes, what do you mean scared of the dog? Because you're scared of the dog. He says, I'm not. I got out of bed and switched it off. So I went downstairs the next morning. I said to me, Dad, he's not scared of dog. It's about after two years of being living with us. I went, why did you tell me that? He went, he goes, I told you that. So you'd, you'd go running with him just to make sure he did the run and he didn't cut corners. Because if I sent him out on himself, there were every chance that he might have not done the run. Because at least if I know he's been with you, you're going to come report back to me. Because back in those days, we didn't have heart rate monitors or trackers or phones or anything to prove you'd done the run. So he kind of made this little story up, which I found funny, you know, to make sure that I went out and, and did a run with him. So all these little methods that Brendan had, it was just by studying fighters, studying human nature, studying people, and looking where fighters are going to cut corners. Because... Even today, they cut corners. There's so many stories about fighters cutting corners. You know, there's a little story one time about Kel Brook. We did the run. I said, right, we're going to do the, the Harold Graham run today. And we took all the lads from the gym. It's only about a six-mile run. And halfway through, you're up this mile hill. And Kel's weight at the back. He's not particularly fit. And, you know, he's only just got back into training camp. And we didn't usually run on the road anyway. Anyway, when we got back to the gym, you know, Kel was in the top three people of about 20. And I couldn't understand how we'd managed to get in front of everybody because I'd rode around me on my bike following him and I knew Keller was at the bike. Somebody says, yeah, they saw him jumping in a van. Somebody waved at oh, Kel. Kel jumped in the van, got up this hill to the top hill, jumped out and ran home, beat everybody. So, you know, that's what happens in boxing. So in order to make sure everything was done precisely, Brendan always had somebody covering, whether it was Nazim Hamid or uh, Errol Graham. There was always somebody running with them. With, with, with Errol Graham, it was either me, my brother. Later years, it was Johnny Nelson. With Naz, it was Ryan Rose. It was always somebody that would keep him on the track to make sure they did the work. So, you know, he, he sat down and worked out the training methods, uh, my dad, and made sure that every aspect of... Uh, the system was covered and that the, the boxers were getting exactly what they needed. A combination of strength, the durability, skill with the pads and then the sparring. So, you know, it was a, a well-worked-out system. It definitely was. And, you know, going, again, going back to you know, your dad's upbringing, um, with regards to all the training, strength, SNC you talked about, cleaning, what you just touched on there. Uh, when I was at uh, Tony's house and I noticed the street outside was absolutely spotless, his house was spotless, and uh, he, he obviously mentioned it that he goes, you won't see a speckle of dirt, not even dust, outside on the railings outside his house. And uh, the sa same mentality. So all the brothers and sisters had the same. Uh... Well, we we see, you know, we look on social media now, and there's all these self-help books, and, and ones like make your bed or something like that. There's, there's these rules for life: get up at five o'clock, make your bed. You know, if your if your bedroom's not tidy, the rest of your life's going to be messy. It's stuff you should know. It's it's old school mentality that you know you go back to ta to harder times that if you can't be disciplined on the simple things like you know keeping the immediate area where you live tidy 
well, if you can't be bothered to do that, how's the rest of your life going to be? And I can remember being a kid in, in, in Winker Bank and you'd, you'd walk up the, the, the road school in the morning and all the women would be out cleaning the doorsteps and sweeping, the, sweeping their bit of the street into the road and keeping everything tidy. And you were kind of frowned upon if you, you, every now and again you, the side of your steps weren't whitened or it wasn't swept up or there was, there was litter outside your house. Everybody made an effort uh, to keep it clean. But nowadays, you know, people think it's, it's beneath them. Uh, if they're in rented accommodation, why should I look after this, you know, this space that I'm in? But that's where discipline begins, you know, do the things you don't particularly want to do. And, you know, the things that you do do will be very, very easy. So that's the kind of lessons for life, what I've always been instilled in kids in this gym. You know, I can remember uh, going back to when uh, Kid Galahad was 13 years old and there was a group of them who trained in the morning all the same age, five or six of them. And they'd finish the workout, uh, and it might be in the school holidays, and Brendan would come and say, right, I was going to uh, give me a hand to, to clean the streets. And they'd go, oh, yeah, Brendan, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll give you a an hand. And my dad would disappear for 10 minutes, come back, and they'd all disappeared. The only person who stayed was Barry. Now, those are the kids fight professionally, and they have fought professionally. But they've not really done it any good, and, and one got beat at the weekend. But Barry, who stayed and did the discipline and did the tidying up and followed the rules and swept the street and helped the old ladies carry the, the shopping up the road to the old people's flat, actually became a world champion. And, you know, he, at that point, he wasn't the best. He came in with no idea of boxing. He was more of a footballer. So just applying those principles and that discipline and listening to Brendan, who had got so many people to, you know, British Commonwealth, European and world champion, just by listening to that advice, got him a lot further on in life and, and, and achieved what he wanted to achieve where the others who took the shortcut and scampered off because they didn't want to be sweeping the streets or doing a bit of community work, you know, that's kind of beneath me, really never amounted to anything in boxing. It's interesting that philosophy that he showed, uh, it's, it's fascinating and he obviously the proof's in the pudding with uh, Kid Callahad. Uh, one of the things I want to ask you about, uh, Dom, is uh, discipline. Uh, were you a disciplined? Obviously we, we saw your dad on camera, a lot of people didn't get to spend personal time with him, so Kind of tell us what was it like discipline-wise. Did you get caned, or do you remember any particular bollockings that you got from your dad? No, I never got. We never got, ever got, um, you know, hit off my dad, wiped or you know, grounded. You know, the only time I ever got any kind of uh, punishment were at school. Got the slipper a few times, uh, but my dad never believed in that kind of stuff because he looked at it this way: that if you're a man, you know, and you're a physical being, you're 30 odd years old, why on earth would you need to use? physical force to control a kid and because realistically you can control uh, kids with just speaking to them properly and educating them and uh, making them think about what they're doing you're never going to make somebody do something by beating it into them you might get them to do it temporarily but then they're always going to they're always going to turn so my dad never never laid a finger on us uh, you know we did the stuff uh, what we had to do because we like to do it and he, he explained to us why we should do it why we should have discipline um, and that kind of lesson has followed all the way through life with us so you know we are, we're up I'm up at five in the morning everybody in my family gets up early same with me brothers you know they all get up and do the work and do the graft and you know there's always going to be hard work but the more you do the hard work eventually you make the hard work easy you know the years and years I spent in this gym uh, you know, getting kids to where they want to be in life, investing time, energy and effort. And, you know, it, it was great when Junior Witter, Johnny Nelson, Kel Brook uh, won world titles. Um, you know, it was fantastic because they put a lot of work in. Uh, but they, they're only going to get there with everybody else putting the work into them also. So, you know, that's how you discipline yourself. So we always got explained to an educated, you know, it was never beaten to us. And my dad used to say, well, you know, you can do it that way. It's like putting your hand in the fire, you're going to get burnt and you're going to learn your lesson. So the lessons we learn, he let us learn the lesson. He went, well, all right, then this is, I think, how you should do it, do it this way. But if you want to do it that way, you do it that way. And when you come back to me, he didn't say, I told you so. He just went, well, that's a lesson learned. So we learned for ourselves. you know, that's how we did it. So, you know, it was, it was the best upbringing, uh, discipline-wise. He used to say, do it for yourself, don't do it for anybody else. And... Uh Moving on, uh, I want to see if you can reaccount this uh, st uh, story. I'm trying to think who told me that might have been Mick Mills. Um, 
when your dad was young, when he used to train fighters and kind of train alongside him, he used to spar a lot of them as well. But he used to go home sometimes towards the end of his uh, boxing career, covered in bruises. And I think he used to shout you up and tell to come and scrub his back. Do you well, remember like bruises yeah, and stuff? But, but this, the, that story is, is that, you know, when we were kids, uh, he, he'd, be, he'd be up in the morning, probably half past five, he'd be off working somewhere on a building site or in a steel works or whatever. We wouldn't see, see him all day. We'd go to school, come back. We'd have a dinner as, as soon as we came back from school, 3.30, have his dinner. We'd be off out playing. He'd finish work about five o'clock, come straight into the gym, be in the gym from, from like probably off four or five o'clock till about half seven at night. Then in them days, you didn't have microwaves, you know, so you'd, my mother would cook the dinner and they'd put it in, in the oven with a, a lid over the top, like a pan lid in the oven on a low heat to keep the food warm. So then he, he'd do all his work, at, you know, in, on a building site, come home, do the gym, and then go home, uh, eat his dinner. In fact, no, he wouldn't eat his dinner, he'd actually go and have a bath first. And his shout was up, come and scrub me back. So he'd go up and give his back a scrub, and he'd be telling us a story or what, or what he'd done that day at work, have his dinner. Then we'd go to bed, and it, would just, it was just like that for years and years and years. But I remember a time he came over and you know, I was a bit older then. I was probably about 16 or 17, obviously not scrubbing his back at that age. But he came in and I can remember my mother saying to him, Brendan, what have you been doing? He goes, oh, I've been sparring with the Nasfella and Ryan Rhodes. And I think at that time they were about 12 or 13. And they both battered him. You know, they were both on him sparring. He went, Phew, there's going to be something special them two. Uh, and they were just developing the man strength at like 12, 12 to 14. And, uh, you know, he used, to, he used to get in and show them all the tricks, all the tying up tricks, you know. Um, he'd go through, go, go through it with them. And I just remember, he going, that's the last time we'll be sparring with them. So he used to get in and spar with the kids uh, just to show them all the, all the tricks of the trade. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, interesting times, it were. Do you ever see your dad uh, cry or get emotional because we only ever saw him smiling and The, the only time I ever saw him cry one, one night, I was actually in bed and there was some kind of commotion going on downstairs and I came down now and he was probably pretty late and he was in tears just holding my mum and uh, he went, he went I'll go back to bed and in the morning I said to my mum what, what wrong because oh, he's, he's just found out his mum's died so his mum Sarah I think uh, he would have been around about maybe 74-ish I'm not too sure and uh, maybe yeah it would have been it would have been about 70, 73-74 so um, and she had leukemia, so I think that's the only time you know I'd, I'd ever seen him uh, upset, really. Um, but parents do that, don't they? They keep it away from the kids. They never, they never kind of um, get upset in front of the kids. If somebody, somebody's got to be the, the cornerstone of the family, aren't they? And keep it all together. And then uh, just wrapping up now, who do you think was his? Uh, I'll use the word favourite, but his personal favourite in, in the gym from all the fighters he's worked with. Do you know what? I don't. I don't think he did. I think. I think his favourites were the ones who listened, the ones we could. I think he, he loved, he loved the lost cause, my dad. Um, he loved the challenge, and 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 I've said this many many times before that, you know, as 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 much as we had the world champions and the top flight fighters, you know, it was the it was the tip of the iceberg. That was the advertisement for the gym, and you know, underneath the ice, underneath the sea, the the bulk of the iceberg, you've got all these kids from troubled families and all walks of life all over Sheffield. And, you know, for, for an hour to two hours a day, they had some kind of different place to go apart from the environment they were on, whether it was escape, you know, their escape, you know, just some kind of entertainment. And, you know, even now I get stopped on most occasions. Oh, your dad and I came down to that gym at this age. Thousands and thousands of kids have come through this gym. And you, you ask them what they're doing now and they're all in decent jobs and, you know, they turn the life around and, they, they, you know, they, they still watch the videos of my dad now. The people turn up out of nowhere. They've come from America, Canada, Australia. Oh, I used to come here when I were a kid and they just roll up. I bumped into a fellow the other day at Costa Coffee down on Meadow Hall. Oh, I walked into the gym the other day, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, it was wide open, nobody in. I went, yeah, that's what happens. It's left open, people walk in, they walk out, never gets vandalised. You know, it's been like that for years. But they've all got a story about, you know, getting took there as a kid. Their dad brought them down and, you know, taught them, they got taught how to fight. And Errol, it was either Errol Graham or Nazi Mamid or Kel Brook or Johnny Nelson. You know, there's everybody got a story. And like I said, thousands and thousands of kids have come through this gym and, and, and they've all benefited in, in, in some way or another. So, you know, it's, it's, been a, it's been a great education over the years. 
It definitely has. Um, I'll, I'll leave uh, with this. Uh, I spoke to Rob McCracken recently and one of the most respected trainers that, that have come from this country and we was talking about you know the best trainers from this uh, part of the world and he basically said your dad was uh, the greatest trainer to ever come from uh, UK and Ireland. I'll chuck that in. And um, I asked him who do you think was the second best and he said there is no second best because <laughs> the gap between him and second is it's that far apart. Yeah, and it's, it's probably right because that you know, whichever way it is, um, uh, the innovation that he developed and uh, the fighters he had, and the way he wasn't only just a, uh, a manager and a trainer, he, he educated people, he publicized people, he thought of ways, he thought outside of the box. Uh, you know, people remember back in the Back in the, the, the late 70s and 80s when Errol Green was coming through, he was from Nottingham, he was black, nobody really heard of him. He was one of Sheffield's favourite boxers. When he ever he boxed, venues were sold out within two or three weeks. Everybody loved him. And, you know, he was an entertaining fighter. But Brendan publicised him, he thought, or every way possible. You know, he used to send me around uh, with, with bill posters and go, go knock on that. Take, he used to take me into industrial estates, ask him to put that up in their office. I used to be embarrassed, I was like 11 years old and you go into these places and, and fellas, I didn't know, and they say, oh, well you have to give us a tenner son, I'm thinking, I got, a, I got a tenner, and I would take it, and they were just winding me up, they loved it, but they wind you up for 10 minutes and they put the poster up, and he used to take me around all these places, all around Sheffield, pubs, can you put this up, and you'd be, you know, you'd have a thousand posters printed off, and me and my brother John when we were 11 and 12, they used to take us out on an evening, go in that pub and ask him to put this up, be walking into pubs like, not knowing what it were all about, and just having to do the, the groundwork but you could guarantee that when uh, Fight Night came along, the Sheffield City Hall, I think it held about 2,000 people, was absolutely packed to the rafters. Um, and, you know, it's same when he, when he, he ran the first show at Bramble Lane, uh, Errol, uh, Errol Graham against uh, a fighter, uh, Lyndall Holmes. And to, to finance that show, he actually mortgaged, remortgaged the house. And luckily, it was a sunny day. I think they got 4,000 people in. It was a success. Errol Graham won, and we managed to keep the house. But, you know, th that phrase, oh, you bet your house on it. Well, back in them days, he, that's what he did. I don't think he, he, had a, he had a care in the world what the consequence were if the, if the show folded and they made no money. The house, we, you know, were getting repossessed. So you think to the extent he went to to make a success of things, uh, you know, it paid off for me and my brother John and in later years because it was already made for us we had to just keep it going learn the business and carry on producing the fighters which you know which we've done 100% uh, and it's just a shame that uh, till this day now we're five years on he still hasn't been inducted into the hall of fame and I hope that does get done well, at some you know, point look, oh, awards are, are nice if you if you're bothered about awards but to be honest you know my dad were never bothered about awards uh, you know whether people you get inducted the, into the Hall of Fame or not, it, it's, it, it's always going to be in the hearts and minds of people. You know, what Brendan did for, for, for Winkerbank, Sheffield, you know, England as a trainer and, and the kids who come through. So, you know, I don't think he'd be being particularly bothered uh, about getting awards. He got awards, he got, he got an MBE. Um, but I think just the, the recognition of the work from the, from the people he did it on, and it's always going to be in the hearts and minds of the people he did work with and he did help. And, and that's worth more than any award, you know, going. So I, I don't think he, he would have been particularly bothered if, you know, if he ever gets into the Hall of Fame, all well and good. But it's well documented what he did uh, with the fighters and the people he brought through. And, you know, it was a, it was a great career that he had. You sure did. Uh, Dom, obviously, just to wrap up, I appreciate your time and obviously you've given me a lot of your time over the last year or so. As you know, I was a big, big fan of your dad. I got you something from uh, from myself uh, towards the gym and it's. Uh, I think I've designed it based around what, what we've done and then your dad, so I'll let you have a look at it first. Oh, very it. good. I got it made uh, personally for you uh, by an artist called Chris Moore. Oh, it's going to take, gonna, gonna take pride, of, pride of place in my house, that. Uh, we've still got that hat, by the way. Um, so yeah, it's a great photo, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm resembling my dad there, aren't I? Yeah. So the, the reason we picked the hat is because I, I know that's one of the most sentimental things you've got left from yeah. your dad. So uh, we've got you both wearing the cap. It's very good. I've still got that, and uh, thank you very much for that. Cheers. No worries. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Very good.